Nico van der Merwe. I am the coordinating program leader for the Chartered Accountancy program at the Northwest University's School of Accounting Sciences. And I would like to talk a bit about the background to our multilingual concept video project within the school. So this project was born from a perfect storm that occurred in 2018 when the NWU has just published its new revised language policy and at the same time the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants or SICA for short has also published their new language policy applicable to the qualifying examinations that prospective chartered accountants need to write in order to be admitted as SICA members. Now on the one hand the NWU policy promotes education in four different languages being English, Afrikaans, Setswana and Susutu. And the SICA language policy cannot be more different from this in that the requirement of the SICA policy is that prospective CAs need to write their qualifying exams in English only being seen as the language of business. Now this resulted in a lot of discussion within the School of Accounting Sciences and the broader faculty as well as with the DVC of Teaching and Learning and various committees of Senate. And ultimately it was decided that the fourth year of the CA program would be offered in English only so as to best prepare students for the qualifying exams of SICA but the third year of the program in terms of formal lectures would occur in English only however the instruction in English would be supported in a variety of ways in the four languages that the NWU promotes and one of these ways would be the production of short concept videos in a variety of languages so the students can listen to the concepts in their mother tongue in order to improve their understanding of the instruction that they received in English. And this is exactly how this project was born. The journey with our project up to this point has been very rewarding but has not been without challenges. Initially in 2019 we started off by drawing up a project plan, identifying the staff to be involved, the, the budget of the resources that we would need, as well as timelines on when what needs to be done. We then had initial discussions and meetings within the school and we decided that it would be the simplest and most efficient to just keep it simple and use PowerPoint with voiceovers. Fortunately, we have very creative staff members in the school that came up with a nice template that everybody could use, including some background music, some introductory animations in the video, etc. We then, up to this point in 2020 semester 1, have produced more than 50 English and more than 50 Afrikaans concept videos. But when it came to the point where we needed to start translating some of these into Setswana and Sesotho, it wasn't initially that easy to obtain the buy-in of all the staff in the school, simply because it was initially felt that the Setswana and Sesotho videos might not be that beneficial for learning because of the fact that the students up to this point have uh, learned and have been instructed in English in terms of the business and accounting terminology. And that includes business and accounting terminology taught at high school level. So the other reason also was the fact that um, even though business and accounting terminology exists in formal Setswana and Susutu, it is not necessarily used in day-to-day -day speak. So we then actually decided that when producing the videos, we would keep the language informal and only use Setswana and Susutu terminology that is used often. And where business and accounting terminology is not used often in day-to-day -day speak, we would rather than use the English terminology within the Setswana and Susutu videos. And we did find that that works very well. We then made the pilot videos available to our students for a trial run and we obtained their feedback. And I'm pleased to say that up to this point, we have an overwhelming majority of students that have indicated that if the videos were available for all the topics in all the subjects in Setswana and Susutu, that they would have used that regularly for learning because it is very beneficial for their learning. So that's very positive feedback that we've received and we will most definitely continue producing all the videos in the four languages of the NWU. And don't say that you will pay input course it's not possible. Input will be claimed and output will be paid. So at the end of the day, the vendor needs to reconcile the VAT position 
to determine what is the net bat effect of all the supplies made by such vendor. So let's say that the only transaction that the vendor had in our scenario was this one single transaction. That means in the net of effect, you will say he had to pay over to source output tax of 30 rand while he was allowed originally to claim back 15 rand input from source. So the net reconciling effect will be a VAT payable to source of 15 rand. If we take a step back, let's consider what happened in the transaction. The vendor added 100% profit to the original cost price. And now he is taxed on all the value added to the product. The tax on the value that was added, we refer to as the value added tax. That's where the naming of that comes from. It's a tax on the value that you added to the product, which we refer to value added tax. As we trek it terug here and net weer die transaksie in geheel beskou, sal ons sien dat 100% wens was op die oorspronkelijke prijs van 115 rand weer die ondernemer gehef toe hy die levering van die goedere aan die klient gemaakt het. So om wat waarde by die oorspronkelijke productse prijs gevoeg is, word daar nou een belasting op hier die waarde gehef en dit noem ons die belasting op toegevoegde waarde. En dis waar die naam van die hele BTW um, ook vandaan kom, is belasting op toegevoegde waarde, is een belasting op die waarde wat door die product toegevoeg is. So wat sy waarde is door die product toegevoeg, in effect het ons gesê, dit is 100 rand, en wat is die BTW op 100 rand? 100 maal met die BTW koers van 15% geef vir ons een BTW van 15 rand. En dit is dan ook die netto effect, van die BTW wat betaal word aan SARS as gevolg van 100 rand extra waarde. Good day, my name is Josie Chavela. I'm senior lecturer in the School of Accounting Sciences, lecturing financial management and management accounting. I was recently involved in a project to translate the taxation videos into the Sutu language. This project meant a lot to me as I'm one of the students that come from the townships where I did my basic education and higher education with Sutu as a first language. I believe this is the experience of most of our students, as many students in the Val campus have Sotho as their first language. Many students in the Mafikan campus have got Sotoan as their first language, and most of our students in the Portuguese campus have got Afrikaans as their first language. So really, English for most of us is actually a second language. Students find it easier to ask me questions in their mother tongue. They often come to my office asking me questions in Sotho, in Zulu or Kosa, and I'm able to answer them in English or Sisutu. I find that students find it easy to articulate questions and express themselves in an easier way and in a way that I can understand when they speak their mother tongue. Now the project uh, was done using informal Sisutu because we needed to start somewhere. We believe that is the language that the students are speaking now and since the students never spoke Sisutu in accounting from their foundation phase, it's very difficult to just introduce formal language at this point. Hopefully in the future we'll be able to do more videos in a formal language manner. But we are very excited since the students have indicated that the videos that we've made are very useful to them and we are looking forward to making many more videos to help facilitate learning for our students. Thank you. How the transaction in our talk le a o rekisa ke tsona fela tse vendor e di entse go bolela gore di tla morao tsa vet tsa vendor e tla ba o patala sa se tetirand me a dumelo ho tlema input go tswa ho sa ya 15 rand jwale go bolela gore o tla me a go patala 15 rand ho sa ha o sheba transaction ka botlara ha go khutlela morao hanya re shebisi sa hantle ho go etsa etse ho etse etse Rebona ho re vendor o edile ka po o kentse 100% profit ho cost ya hai jwala ka hare ntse re buile jwale o texua ho value ai edile ke ka ho tax ena e bitswa value added tax o texua value in e we edile ke tax ho value e we kentseng ho ntse o direkisa 
re edile hanret rand good day i am makabiso mudisa dfi a senior lecturer at the school of accounting science at the northwest university i participated in the setswana concept videos for financial accounting my experience in making the sample concept videos is that i struggled in translating especially the accounting terminologies however because we agreed on using the everyday language that we speak i think through practice commitment and support from us as lecturers translation will not be much of a challenge i believe that this is going to be beneficial to our students because some students who didn't do english as their first language take time in understanding concept if only explained in english this is further proved by students responses after listening to our videos they said that they understood um concepts better now after they have listened to those concepts explained in their home language hi everyone my name is alisa cavazos and i'm an associate professor of rhetoric and composition in the department of writing and language studies at the university of texas rio grande valley utrgv is located in deep south texas along the mexico us border and utrgv aspires to become a bilingual biliterate and bicultural institution at utrgv i have the opportunity to teach courses in writing and writing instruction at the undergraduate and graduate level i teach these classes through a linguistically inclusive approach we have conversations about language difference in our own experiences and history with writing in language we have the opportunity to engage in conversations um, as we explore scholarly research on translanguaging and we also have the opportunity to enact language difference in the things that we create and the things that we produce for different audiences and different purposes in this video i would like to share with you some of those strategies that i use in the classroom and i also hope to pose some questions that you can explore and think about as you discuss um, after watching these videos i have students in my class who self-identify um in terms of you know being monolingual in english uh, or multilingual or bilingual knowing english and spanish and to different degrees um, their linguistic abilities in either of those languages vary and the, the this linguistically nuanced and complex experiences with language uh, from our students and for myself included um, provides us with rich opportunities to engage conversations about language and language difference and language perceptions um, and linguistic ideologies um, so i always like to share with my students and my colleagues that I learned English as a second language. And I didn't always have the teachers who supported and who guided me in ways that um, I would have hoped. Um, I do remember one teacher who um, vividly um, shared with me that it's an asset to know more than one language and that I should continue practicing and using Spanish. But throughout my education, this was the only uh, teacher who ever indicated or showed any interest in my ability to read and write in another language. And I would say my ability to uh, read and write in Spanish um, in English uh, varies. It's um, my, my education, my ed higher education, my degrees, uh, we're all in English. And I would consider my ability to read academic Spanish um, not as equal as my ability to read academic English. And by that, I mean academic articles in, in, in English and in Spanish. Um, but that doesn't mean that I, I don't engage in reading academic articles in Spanish. I do. And when I have, I have found them to be quite fruitful. And they expand my knowledge and my ability to make meaning of what I'm reading and what I'm um, experiencing and engaging in in different ways, um, in ways that I wouldn't have been able to do if I'm only reading and engaging in one language. 
Uh, and so I would like to share with you some of the strategies that I use in my, in my classes to engage students in these conversations. One of those strategies um, is that I encourage students to analyze their language abilities as rhetorical resources. And by that, I mean that I encourage students to reflect on their experiences with language and writing in, in different languages um, and in different contexts. Um, so particularly, we explore how have they used their abil uh, different linguistic abilities in different contexts and how have they navigated and negotiated their, their use of the linguistic difference for uh, different purposes. Um, and the purpose is to build awareness of our many linguistic strengths and how we can leverage them or how we can transfer these linguistic abilities to different contexts. Um, so even if I am uh, asked to write an academic art paper in or a biology report, for instance, in English, that doesn't mean that I'm not drawing on my knowledge and um, resources in Spanish to write that report. Um, and so that this, uh, this um, initial writing experience invites students to think about how do we actually draw on our linguistic abilities and how do we transfer them into different contexts. Um, in other words, how do we use our full linguistic repertoire to achieve aims? And so one of the questions that I like to pose students because it's, it's one of the challenges that arises when we start having these conversations is that how can we move away from language separation ideologies which often prevent us from transferring our full linguistic abilities into other contexts. So we always tend to say, well, I use Spanish in this context and this other context I only use English instead of looking at how do we draw on our full linguistic repertoire in both of those instances um, in order to truly and fully embrace our, our linguistic resources as a whole. Second, I like to provide students with examples of language difference in multiple contexts, both in academic context and in our community. And I do this because I want students to really identify how do we navigate and negotiate languages um, for, for different audiences and different purposes. The most important part of this um, exercise is that I invite students to bring their own examples to, to class to share with each other. Um, so they do that through uh, perhaps personal interviews or observations in the community, particularly nonprofit community organizations in a region, um, primary documents such as um, social media posts, ads, um, uh, brochures uh, within our community. How and then we analyze these these examples. How are people uh, engaging their full linguistic repertoire as a whole to convey meaning and to uh, simultaneously draw on their linguistic resources um, in these uh, in these contexts? And we take a deep dive into an analyzing these um, these uh, these uh, examples. Uh, one of the questions um, that arise and one of the challenges in our conversations is um, how can we challenge language correctness or standard language expectations uh, or English only ideologies or Spanish only ideologies, um, it, particularly when la standard language might be the expectation but may not necessarily align with the goals for that particular context. So perhaps we have the expectation that we um, read something in standard American English or um, standard Spanish, for example. Uh, however, um, that, that language may not have the impact that we intended it to have in our community for the specific audience we're trying to reach. So it defeats the purpose um, of, of using a standard language expectation or a monolingual uh, linguistic ideology. And so we try to challenge that um, and, and analyze that. How can we challenge that in these examples? And I invite you to think about that as well. How do we move past um, the social expectations of language correctness? Finally, I invite students to compose in diverse languages and discourses for different audiences. 
Um, and one way to address the question that I just posed on, on language correctness is to design assignments and activities and projects that push our students um, and to push our, ourselves, right, as mono, multilingual um, uh, users of language, right, to move past these linguistic monolingual expectations. Um, and that is to design assignments that have meaning and that are authentic and that have real impact in our communities. Um, and so a, a lot of that also requires us to co-design and co-create with our students um, in order for them to, to gather and use their full linguistic repertoire. A question I'd like to pose students is how can we draw on our full linguistic abilities to connect with others for specific academic or community-based contexts? What challenges might we face when we do um, try to use other languages um, or, or engage in, in uh, translanguaging in, in these instances? Um, and, and how can we, can we do that in such a way that, um, that allows us to be inclusive of different languages beyond my class, beyond my course that, that invites that, that use and into other courses that maybe the professor may not be too receptive to that idea. And so I invite students to think about that alongside with me so we can create more linguistically inclusive spaces together. Um, I wish I was there with you. I hope you found these short examples um, meaningful. I look forward to learning more about what you all discuss and engage. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, if you have any questions or concerns and as you engage with each other in, in your space. Um, I look forward to learning more. And uh, my email is alisa, A-L-Y-S-S-A dot cavazos, C-A-V-A-Z-O-S at utrgv.edu. Feel free to reach out anytime. Take care. Hi. My name is Lucy McNair, and I am Associate Professor of English at LaGuardia Community College, part of the City University of New York, where I teach academic and creative writing. I'm a trained translator and scholar of North African indigenous literature and film, and I've always sought to bring a multilingual lens into my writing pedagogy. For the past two years, I've joined my colleague here, Lee Garrison Fletcher, in co-leading an interdisciplinary faculty seminar, Language Across the Curriculum, which we call LAC. And we wish to talk to you about it today. Yes, hello. Um, so I'm Lee Garrison Fletcher, and I'm an associate professor of linguistics and ESL at LaGuardia. Um, I teach linguistics courses and academic ESL in the Department of Education and Language Acquisition. My research interests focus on language acquisition and literacy development, particularly among adolescents and adults, and the importance of building on learners' language backgrounds in this process. Um, so we're delighted to have been invited to share our experiences with you today. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving you just a little bit of context about where we teach. Um, so LaGuardia Community College, which is part of the City University of New York, as Lucy said, or CUNY, um, and CUNY is the largest urban university system in the United States. LaGuardia Community College is one of seven community colleges um, that are part of CUNY. Uh, like all CUNY schools, LaGuardia is located in New York City. Um, it is located specifically in the borough of Queens, which is arguably the most ethnically diverse urban area in the world. Um, LaGuardia serves around 36,000 students um, with about 19,000 enrolled in degree-seeking programs. And the diversity of Queens is of course mirrored in that of our LaGuardia students. Um, we have students from around 150 different countries and our students speak around 100 different languages. So since 2010, LaGuardia has gradually shifted resources away from remedial and ESL education to what we call accelerated learning. And this integrates academically novice students and emergent bilinguals in mainstream credit-bearing courses while providing them with extra support. So today, most incoming students who need to develop academic skills to succeed at college take these accelerated composition and math courses where they meet three extra hours in a small group with their professors. In addition, 
since 2019, CUNY has done away with an entrance exam for most incoming students in favor of looking at evidence of previous academic achievement. So looking at their high school um, grade average, maybe they took SAT scores, <clears throat> their TUFL scores. This double shift has brought changes in the demographics of our classrooms. Um, they've brought more emergent bilinguals directly into credit bearing courses, as well as more multilingual students who struggle with academic standards of American English. Um, so um, being an institute of higher education in the United States, English is the dominant language at LaGuardia. Um, while our linguistic landscape has smatterings of other languages, the vast majority is in English. Um, and with such a mismatch between the landscape um, and our students, we saw the need to raise language awareness of our community, especially given the demographic shifts that Lucy just mentioned. So we have been providing the professional development um, lack that Lucy also mentioned before um, through our Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, and this workshop uh, we offer for faculty and staff across the campus with the aim of promoting multilingualism as an asset and implementing more inclusive pedagogy that is multilingual that questions the hegemony of English in our institute and that emphasizes the need for all instructors to focus on language in their classes. So in addressing one of the questions posed by the organizers of this panel, the question, how is multilingual pedagogy different from mere translation of content? I'd like to focus on language ideologies. In the United States, the dominant view has been that multilingual students have a deficit, that they need English. This is in contrast to the view that multilingualism is an asset. It's an essential learning tool that students have, and it's an advantage to be multilingual not a problem that needs to be fixed. Multilingual pedagogy embraces multilingualism, sees it as an asset and uses it as part of the educational tool. On the other hand, if we think of just translating content in order to make the course content accessible for those who lack English proficiency, this is part of the deficit view. So, Multilingual pedagogy really requires a valuing of multilingualism. It's not just a way to get to English. Um, another question was about how instructors can use translanguaging, can use multilingual pedagogy in their classes if they don't know the languages of their students. This question comes up very often in our LAC workshops. Um, because it's common at LaGuardia to have students from at least five different language backgrounds in every class. So it's essential that we um, can implement this multilingual pedagogy without knowing all the languages of our students. Um, so one thing that is very important to think about is that we all have to give up some of our control. Uh, when students from the same language background are working together Speaking and using a language the instructor doesn't know, um, often they think, well, how can I be sure that they're talking about course content? Um, and the answer is, we can't know that. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. But really, how much do we know about what students are talking about when they're working in groups, even if they are speaking in English, right? Um, also, we we can encourage our students to use multilingual resources and provide them these resources, even if we don't know the language. For instance, something as simple as encouraging students to use bilingual dictionaries or allowing them to use a translation app on their phone can go a long way in promoting multilingualism and encouraging students to view their languages as useful tools that belong in classrooms. Um, so I'm just going to share a brief strategy that I use when I teach academic ESL, which is essentially um, an English writing course. So I start off this semester and I assign the first homework to students, asking them to write anything they like from one paragraph to one page in any language that they like. Uh, many students don't really understand and, and take me up on the offer to bring in languages other than English. Um, but some do. 
Uh, and then the next class, we have a discussion in English about writing. We talk about what is writing, why do we write, and students reflect on how they approached their homework assignment. Um, students share in groups what they wrote. If students wrote in the same language, then they can read each other's writing, um, or they can explain in English what they wrote about to other students. So I do this in order to set the tone in the class as being open to other languages, to counter the idea that writing is only in English, and to continue to invite students to bring in their language resources throughout the semester. So a big question for us is what does LAC mean for students? How do they experience this shift? When faculty know more about language ideologies, about language acquisition and bilingualism, and about the linguistic landscape of our college, they can more quickly invite students to identify and value their language skills and make informed choices. In turn, students can begin to ask why they use or don't use their resources and what they want to do in the future. So take English-Spanish bilingualism. We are a Hispanic serving community college and about 60% of our students identify as Latino Latina with varying degrees of competency and literacy in Spanish. Many faculty and staff speak Spanish fluently as well. Until now, the common belief has been to avoid using Spanish in order to promote fluency in English viewed as the avenue to success. So meaning well, the college has reinforced a common and extremely prevalent language stigma to the detriment of all failing to recognize English-Spanish bilingualism as an asset and a skill. So Lack fundamentally questions this ideological position and educational myth and invites students, faculty, and staff to rethink and reuse their bilingualism to learn and collaborate. So it really questions how we're navigating um, in, in on campus with our languages. But LaGuardians as a whole are fundamentally multilingual, as Lee has explained, and adept at moving between several languages. So to link to the issue she addressed above, how translation works in the LAC context, I want to share what I do in one of my classes. I teach a composition course on the theme of lost and found in translation that invites students to reflect on their linguistic repertoires and skills as interpreters, as we read and analyze a whole variety of texts on the subject and the theory of translation. And we learn about the fallacy of equivalency between languages, how each translation is really an act of interpretation and negotiation. And this leads us to the core of academic inquiry. You know, how do we understand each other? How can we be accurate? Um, how do we go between points of view? Students are surprised to find out that they have expertise in these kinds of negotiations, since they have translanguaged since they were kids, and that these skills are valued in academic and business contexts. The choice is then theirs. What do they want to do with their language skills? Do they want to add to them? Do they want to correct them? or do they want to transform them? So to sum it up, LAC seeks to constructively disrupt the status quo on how we perceive and talk about language, as our colleague, Dr. Kate Menken has put it. Lee and I wish to thank Rosemary Wildsmith and our contact here, Andrea Parmigiani, for their invitation to join you today. Yes, thank you. And we hope that this brief overview of our work here in New York connects with your work and your concerns. And we look forward to more exchange.